So welcome, good afternoon, good morning, um, wherever you are. Um, my name is Anto Budiarjo and uh, welcome to Monday Live. This is um, something that we put together a few weeks back to, to help us get through the pandemic and also try and figure out what's on the other side um, of this pandemic, uh, specifically for commercial buildings. Uh, um, information is on mondaylive.org, including uh, profiles or links to profiles of all of the members of uh, this group. Uh, and just a reminder that um, the uh, views expressed here are personal and not um, any, uh, from any organization or company that, uh, that is uh, behind us, as it were. Uh, please do uh, post uh, comments and Q&A on, on Zoom, uh, and then, um, if possible, complete the uh, survey at the end. Um, so our agenda for today um, is we'll spend 10-15 um, minutes talk about big picture um, news and sort of trends that uh, we're seeing um, and maybe some best practices, experiences. Um, then the main part of um, our show today is really talking about cybersecurity, effectively how, uh, specifically how COVID or the pandemic is, uh, has changed or is going to change cybersecurity in, in building. Uh, and, um, uh, comments and, and questions. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to quickly scan through um, these slides. These slides are just link, uh, a collection of links that uh, the members have uh, found interesting. Um, the slide deck is uh, on mondaylive.org if you want to see any of the, uh, the links. So uh, over there. Um, John Petsy, um, I haven't had a key some uh, partnerships, um, Siemens and Salesforce, um, other sort of interesting industry stuff going on. Um, Jim Butler talking about cybersecurity and some of his observations that I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, Mark Petock, uh, again, talking about something that we talked about last week, um, the, the retail sector um, in, uh, in London, in the UK, and other subjects. Uh, Bill Ben, um, this is kind of a very interesting um, video of um, uh, Fried Zakaria uh, talking about the, the future of cities. Um, recommend you watch that. Um, Anno has written a dissertation here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what about. Um, opportunities, uh, building as a service and various other things. Um, these are slides uh, from previous weeks that are here just for completeness from Steve Fay and others, Therese, Alper, and I, I saw this yesterday and I thought when I first read it, it was the start of a joke, but it was not. It's very serious. So if you're in elevators, you're going to be facing the wall by the looks of it. So I thought that's very interesting. So with that, let's get back to the group. Um, good afternoon, group. What are you guys seeing? What's What new stuff that you're seeing? What trends that sort of... Uh, come to mind that um, you want to talk about for to get the, this thing going? Well, let me start from, since I'm in Arizona and we've been on the news a lot lately, um, we are going back into um, kind of, I wouldn't call it a lockdown, but a step backwards in terms of commercial retail space. Um, so we're seeing more businesses closing back down, more buildings closing back down. Um, of course, there's a big legal battle going on now, whether the governor is targeting unfairly certain industries and so forth. But right as everybody bought their supplies to open back up and clean everything and took care of their buildings and what needed to be done to get them ready to reopen, we're now taking a step backwards, so we should probably replay some of our discussions from six or eight weeks ago, uh, perhaps, because mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen again here in Arizona, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're, you're not the only one. Uh, Texas is not having uh, too much fun, Alpa and Anno. Uh, we're going backwards as well, although uh, probably we're not reacting as quickly as we probably should, but... Yeah, so it's the same, it's getting worse. Any um, specific industry observations as to what's going on? Any sort of changes of, um, I think previously we've talked that some people are having a very positive busy time, others are not. Any other observations on that front? 
I can chime in one more time, um, you know, throughout this whole thing, just from a business standpoint, um, you know, we felt like we had an opportunity with our resources to try to help out, whether it be through Asia connections and getting PPE in or manufacturing or, or service or education, whatever it is. But interestingly, um, now we're starting to see a few opportunities to do um, sort of product development work for products and systems and platforms that are specifically targeted towards solving certain problems from the pandemic within the, the automation space and building space. So we're looking at uh, a company that's coming out with, I can't really talk too much about it, but coming out with a touchless kiosk temperature taking kind of a, a situation which we've discussed on here a few times. Um, that's, that's a pretty good example. And then another software platform where people are, are looking to do contact tracing and things like that. So Addressing there is uh, there seems to be a uh, little, even if it might turn out to be short term industry <laughs> popping up around solutions that attack some of the problems that we've discussed in this forum over the past few months. Yeah, I, I want to echo what Tracy is saying. We've been approached twice now, same look at platform integration of systems that are much wider than we've normally talked to with the specific goal of solving um, contact tracing, general people migration movement within buildings and stuff. So like, and so far coming out of the APAC market region more than anywhere else. Um, but as Tracy said, looking at how do we do more with other things that we've got in the building and they're trying to solve specific problems that, uh, that have been put in front of them. So it's interesting stuff. I mean, it's not something we would have thought of or considered, you know, six months ago. Basically outcome as a platform. Right? Outcome as a platform. Yeah. That's your new mantra for, for the next month, um, Ken? Yeah. Yes, that's what uh, what sort of sort of seems to be. Everything seems to be starting to drive that way. I'm seeing sort of a I don't know if I want to call it a floating or a separation of uh, you know the building control was always there for comfort and now the safety and security, cybersecurity, which we're going to talk about later, is becoming a bigger piece. And uh, yeah, they're starting starting to see a particular outcome they're looking for and that outcome they need to reach out to existing automation systems and incorporate <clears throat> new ones. So yeah, I think it's, I think that's the future. Cool. Any, any, um, any other things from anyone else? Uh, Ken, since the uh, outcome is, uh, is the new mantra, there's probably a book I can suggest you read um, called Mastering the Complex Sale by Jeffrey Thull, T-H-U-L-L. It's a, sort of a, one of those business classics has been around a little while, but it, it talks about how you do outcome-based selling in, in a complex environment. Uh, so it might give you some good material for your, for your articles. Good. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. Yep. Actually, best, best cartoon I heard was uh, this whole virus was started by aliens and they're just simply fattening us up before they're going to eat us. I thought that was a good overview. <laughs> Why not? We've done that to the chickens. Those that are left. <laughs> as viable as half of the stuff you hear out there. <laughs> Touche. Uh, that is true. Um, how about you, Therese? What's, uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley? I always ask that question. You should be prepared. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute, Therese. You're on mute. There you go. There I am. Well, um, as always, I think Silicon Valley is um, not coming back to work uh, or to the office and trying to have trying to figure out how um, to make the most of work from home. Um, I have to say, I spent the week, um, the 4th of July week up in the Sierras. Um, so I'm a little bit out of it. But we're also having fires too. The, the fireworks set off fires in Gilroy and very delicate environment here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Great. So um, I am going to pull in to the to the panel here a couple of guests, um, Carol Lamanaco and Fred Gordy. They should appear here soon. Um, both are obviously sort of um, those that know um, Carol and, and um, Fred uh, very involved in cybersecurity. So um, let's kick off the conversation about cybersecurity. Um, and really sort of the big, the first question that uh, would be really good to discuss is uh, how, how is COVID, how is the pandemic changing the cybersecurity landscape for buildings? Um, Carol, do you want to start? Hello. Sure. sure, I think there's been a lot of questions about remote access, how to securely uh, connect to their BAS systems remotely. And we've kind of put out some good practices, um, not, not things that aren't too obvious, but you know, be careful where you uh, connect to. You know, you don't want to be in a coffee shop over Wi-Fi. Maybe um, <clears throat> have a good system that you can trust, and then so forth. And then the last thing is, you know, how they have the timeout session logout. We tell people don't just let that thing expire. In, in 10 or 20 minutes, you log out, actually log out. So there's some good tips, good questions coming back. And um, I think uh, it's appropriate for the times. And our, uh, when you talk to clients, which I think you do, end users and building owners and IT departments, are you seeing an increase or a decrease in the need for cybersecurity? Because of COVID? They want you to review. Yeah, definitely. They want to review, you know, user access, uh, device access, you know, who's authenticating, what can authenticate, what about VPNs, what about firewalls? So, you know, you review the whole gamut. Okay, great. Thank you. Fred, hello. Hey, hey, can you hear me okay? Oh, loud and clear. So tell us what you're seeing out there. So, I want to start with something that has been um, pretty much an issue since I've been doing this. It's remote access. I know we just talked about it. Um, Having been the guy that actually installed these systems years ago, I know how the systems are installed and remote access has been primarily from the vendor. What's happened now is we're seeing an uptick in people that are, you know, everybody's trying to come up with a remote solution and that's great, but they have no foundational policies. They have no foundational processes to do it. So what they're doing is they're rushing to a solution and that's, can actually create more problem than it than it actually solves. So the the concern there, and as you guys may have seen some of the things that I'm posting lately, is some of the things we're seeing. And um, you know, one of the things that's if there's any good that can come out of this particular situation with remote everybody needing remote access. The other thing that we're seeing an uptick in is people are coming to us and saying, you know, hey, can you help us with our policy? Can What can we do from a policy compliance standpoint? Because at the end of the day, if you just uh, basically throw your systems out on the web, you're, you're going to get what you, you asked for. So thank you. Thanks, Fred. Others want to comment that there are quite a few of us um, on, on this uh, group that is uh, focused on cyber security. So I'll, throw, I'll, throw, I'll start, I'll throw this out. So both to Carol and Fred. So more to what you just fr uh, said, Fred, about the policy. And I would uh, add strategy as part of that. But where I wanted to go with this is that policy strategy is not, tech on, is not the technology side. I put it as the business side. And do you think that COVID has truly changed the mindset of people and are they're looking at it from the business perspective just as much as they're looking at it from the technology perspective? If I can, uh, that's a really good question, Mark. Uh, here's what I would say, and this is the trend that we're seeing. It's an awakening. It's not an on fire, everybody's rushing to, to do these things, but there is an awakening that we're seeing among these different companies. Um, the problem is, like you said, policy is one part of it. The other side is process. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat down with people 
help them create policy. And I, and that's all they hired me to do. The next step is, okay, how are you going to take it and roll it out to the people? Because you're not talking about just handing policy over. What you're talking about is changing the culture. The culture has been the facility management side of the house has been working independently for years and years. They could do whatever they wanted and that they weren't under the, the uh, control of any policy. So therefore they have no processes. There's no uh, compliance check behind it. So there's a lot of steps that have to happen. Fred, I'm curious since I know you guys have um, access to end users, is there any advancement in terms of who owns this problem? Meaning are they, are the is facilities in IT uh, really having better conversations around the policy and procedure side and saying, okay, it's, it originates here, but you guys manage it. Is there, what, what's it, what if anything is happening in terms of how it's being done from the owner's side? Uh, well, that, oh, wow. It's good questions. And quite frankly, there's a multitude of answers and I'll try to keep it down to just a few. What we're seeing where you have a house that has a really strong IT department and they've had this independent FM side is when the when when they're being forced to come together, uh, I, IT is taking it from an IT approach. You know, they're just use the hammer. Let's let's go at it. And the FM side is being resistant. That's that is one aspect of it. So my job has been to sit between the two of them and get them to come to the table together. The next set of people that we run into are the ones that are look, we know there's a problem, but we don't know what to do. And we have a very limited IT resource. So that IT resource really looks back to us to say, listen, we, we don't have the answers and we're willing to, to listen to you. And the FM side of the house, because they see an IT side that is more uh, amiable to the process, they tend to get along a little bit better and get to results a little quicker. So, yes. so. Carol, I'd say I'm seeing the same thing, Mix. And uh, also, I think a third element is, um, unfortunately, some of the companies are reducing their staff. So that's kind yep. of thing, like uh, they got enough work, plus they're on a reduced staff, and they can't take on anything else, especially when it comes to process and policy. It's, it's not, it's not going to happen, I don't think. Can, can I relay a story real quick? This is a customer that we were working with. Um, when it comes to the policy side, they engaged us to write their policy and we got down to the point and I'd been telling them all along that somebody has to own this. Somebody's going to have to take this through the process. Well, when they finally brought the big guy in and I'm explaining to him what has to happen, you know, there's the, the rollout adoption and then compliance that has to happen. He's kind of looking around the room like, okay, do who's going to take this and run with it? What is our process for rolling this out? Did y'all not think about that? We may have to put the brakes on this. And so there's that realization, even though we can tell them in the front end that, you know, we can do all this, but this paper is only as good as what you do with it after we hand it to you. So that's, that's a gap that um, a lot of companies have. Brad, I have a question for you. What customer segments are you seeing the best uh, forward movement and, and uh, integration between IT and facilities? Actually, commercial real estate, believe it or not. And uh, some of the, let me qualify that. It's just, you know, the guys that are on, that own the building, they're, they're selling them, buying them, doing all this. But when you get into like uh, financial, military, um, hospital, it's a slow adoption. So I, the thing is, the, the commercial real estate guys are actually almost treating this like a marketing thing, which is good, I guess. But what they're saying is they're going to get their, their building stamped with a, you know, hey, we're cyber secure. And then when they get ready to sell it, then they can, you know, kind of like, a, you know, 100 point inspection for a car. I'm really enjoying your um, LinkedIn post, Fred. And I Thank think... You. Um, that the one where you just had the picture of the two different cultures, the IT culture um, represented with the data center and how the cybersecurity mindset is everything from physical access to 
um, encryption at all levels. And then you have what you typically walk into is um, a desk with and an open desk, shared passwords. Um, that was great. And, and the dialogue you're starting, like everybody waiting. Oh, for that's been the awesome part. I, I actually decided to take a, you know, back when I started doing this, man, I was studying this uh, SP853A and all of, I still study all that. But the average facility person doesn't get all that yet. I like to equate this. Remember, I think we're all old enough to remember uh, back in the day when OSHA first started, all these safety rules came around. Well, the, the guys that were, that these safety rules were being imposed on, they were used to doing things their way, right? So over a period of time, like when you first started, if I was afraid to climb up on a ladder and change a light bulb and hang out there, my coworkers would call me, you know, hey, you're a wimp. Now your coworker will turn you in if you do that. Why? Because there's been a culture shift, but that culture shift wasn't started by cramming all these rules and regulations down. They had to, A, there had to be a business reason to do it, and C, the people that actually had to do it had to be introduced into it slowly. So I've changed my approach on LinkedIn, and my approach is I'm going to throw a picture up of what I've seen. This is the problem, and I can tell you the number of hits that I'm getting has exploded and you know people will come and say like this one guy said well you just taking the keyboard off is not going to fix the problem absolutely right but it's a step you know so yeah there's a lot of a lot of interaction and that's what we need i have a follow-up question for carol who said we talked about the budgets being restricted because of covid um does johnson uh, or just you on a personal level do you think it, it represents an opportunity to sell service agreements where you guys take responsibility for the cyber? Well, that's an interesting question too, because then, then you have to have your internal legal departments do that. And so that's more risk. And I think, um, yeah, there's probably both sides of the argument. It's, it's almost like hosting somebody's BAS system, right? Um, right. And so um, I think, yeah, that, I think we're going to see both sides. We're going to, I don't think we're going to get people to adopt policy and all this in these times, because I really think there's still going to be a lot of employees losing their jobs and people downsizing. And uh, that's just the nature of it. Hmm. I, I don't, I think, I think right now they're just trying to survive. If I can, I really can see on that. I think companies are trying to survive right now. So yeah, they want to do good cyber practices. Um, but I think they're really watching an eye on revenues and trying to keep their employees and make it out of this uh, difficult time. Are you seeing um, any sort of changes in, in attitude or behavior in, in the channel? Either the, you have branches, obviously, and um, there are um, other organizations, independent um, channel system integrators and others. Uh, maybe I'll put that to both you, Carol, and, and, and Fred and others. Is, is uh, I think Fred, you talked about a, a mind shift specifically on the owner side, but I'm wondering about the supply part of it. Well, um, I can say that we've actually been approached by integrators a few. Um, uh, if I, going back to my roots, when I first started this journey, the the pushback from the integrator was, this is just going to add cost to my uh, my installation. But I think what's happening is now they're seeing the liability aspect of it. Um, that, you know, every, you, you can no longer say obscurity through obscurity and you can no longer say, well, it's not my problem. It's like everybody's problem. But it's, it's gonna take a little while to get the adoption there, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I've been on the phone with some third party integrators and they're actually seeing, trying to understand uh, because it's in the specs. And they just wanted, oh, well, what do I gotta do to meet it? but at least they're being more open-minded. Um, right. And they, yeah, and they realize that if they miss something and expect, it could cost them money down the road. So they want to be really thorough and uh, just doing inventories and, you know, the whole, you know, following the, the you know, what's specced. Um, I, think, I think they're trying to do, there's a change in attitude. I have seen that over the years. Um, 
and, and they want to comply and they want to know, well, what if I miss it? What's it going to cost me? Things like that. So I, I think they're coming around. I think they're seeing the light. It kind of goes to what Fred said earlier. I like that word. It's like an awakening. And I'm seeing that in the channel and all different parts of the value chain. So, yep. So beside remote access, which we talked about earlier, I believe and I'm seeing that uh, there's been an increase in ransomware and maybe, you know, Fred and uh, you guys, uh, you know, I, we, Carol or the group can talk about some specific issues maybe. And then also I'm seeing um, an increase in vulnerabilities in applications. And um, I don't know, and I, you know, I'm trying to equate that. Is that because of COVID? Is that because cybersecurity in general, but especially the apps and how people who are developing apps need to harden uh, their apps a lot more than maybe what we used to. So uh, anyway, just curious, any specific things the group can talk about that they're seeing as a result of COVID beside remote access? I'll step in. Um, the, the activity around ransomware has gone exponentially high. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell you that our experience, there's been a 600% increase. We've also have a practice where, um, we, we do OT phishing and it's different than IT phishing. And if you look at any studies out there, 30%, the hit rate on an IT phishing campaign is 30%. Our average right now is 75% hit rate. And the reason is, is because the, the phishing is changing as it relates to facility guys. And what I mean, not pick on Carol, <laughs> but I mean like some, we've seen some examples of where they've actually misspelled Johnson controls and sent that and said that, you know, hey, if you click on this survey for Johnson control, you'll get a you know hundred dollar gift card or something like that. So they're tailoring their, their fishing specifically around things that relate to these guys. So. 75 percent that's scary. yeah yeah and we've yeah. had one customer's 88 percent yeah and i would agree i i think uh the ransomware it's around the globe as well mm -hmm. uh, some countries it's it's really high and they just have to train that you know you shouldn't be shopping with your server treat it you know shouldn't be look at your emails and again if you don't remember anything about a purchase order or something like that pictures then don't click on it you know right don't do it always question mm -hmm. so what's what's the core difference between it and ot phishing is just is it just the the target or what is what is the result out of what what are they trying to do are they actually trying to you know stop systems ot systems from working or it just happens to be the entry point so taking a look at phishing, first off, what it is, it is a cheap, effective way to, for the bad guy to get money. That's all he cares about. Um, so it's not necessarily about taking the system down or anything, but what it is, is, you know, waking the, making a, uh, what it is ransom, you know, you got to pay me for this to be able to be unlocked. Uh, to what Carol was saying, the, these guys know, the bad guys know that the facility guys misuse, and I say this all the time, but they misuse their application server. Would you go and own a SharePoint server and check your email? Absolutely not. Why are we doing that with our application host? The, the machine, whether it is a server class machine or a PC, it's still an application server or application host. These guys, I've got example after example of them using it to check, you know, Facebook, Gmail, they're searching, I <laughs> got this one picture, or uh, one thing where we captured, and I don't know what language this is, but they're, they're searching all over the place. So all it takes is, and they don't necessarily, first off, the fish, they don't care what they hit, just as long as they hit something to lock it down. Second is, everybody's used to, you may win a $500 Amazon gift card if you click this link. What's happening is they're using things like your chiller looking emails. 
Johnson Control, Tritium, whatever. Whatever is going to resonate with that guy. Yeah, very similar to what they used to do with FedEx. They used to show FedEx and uh, different companies like that. So. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Hey, Fred, you know that, that point you were making about the operators are using the, you know, the BAS server to get on the net and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Is that, do you think that's a function of the fact that the servers do have internet access or the BAS SI guys have provided access, whereas their normal workstations are not are locked down? So the cult, going back to what I said earlier about the culture and, you know, like I say, I'm coming from 16 years of experience of doing this. And the, the method of operation was me as an integrator, I would build your application host and it'd probably be on a Dell PC. Stick it in your office. You would say, hey, why don't you buy a couple of workstations to go along with this? Ah, no, we're just, we just use this. So they've gotten used to having that machine in there that they could sit down at and check their system. But at the same time, they use it to do anything else that they, they want to do. So, um, it's all culture. It's all culture. And, and to your point about the internet access, we used to try to restrict just internal to, to the systems and everything. But what happened is the, the facility guys complained so much to us that, Hey, if I want to get out and research a part, I should be able to do that. Well, okay. But we know that you're going to go elsewhere, but we would open it up and let them go do whatever they wanted to do. So here's a, here's a question, uh, another one for the group, and maybe Carol can start it off, is that obviously with COVID, we've all seen the increase in new things that uh, people are developing, companies are developing uh, to help uh, combat and whatever with COVID. And one of these is the increase in mobile applications. Is the increase in mobile applications going to open up cyber risk, uh, you know, much more greater than ever before. Because if I got my mobile app and I might be in the, in the office, my office building, and for whatever reason, we've got some app that does A, B, and C, I'm on it, but my phone isn't as secure as the network and everything else that we've taken precautions on. Do you guys see that as being a future issue? Uh, yeah, I, I really do. I think uh, the apps are, are apps, right? As good as you design in and, and take care of <coughs> vulnerabilities and um, you know keep an eye on the platform. Is it a laptop app or is it a phone app? Yeah, I think I think we're going to see a mixed bag, especially with this tracing algorithms. You know, with contact tracing. Um, also, you know, are we? You know, people are having these debates about you know uh, trying to stay six feet apart and have the have your phone buzz and things like that. Um, so I think we are going to see some of those. Um, hopefully, the ones from that our our companies and government. You know that that they they've done some testing and had somebody pen test and try to try to own the box or you know the app, so so I think it's going to be a mixed bag. Yeah, I I think those that are rush don't do the thorough testing, thorough engineering design. We're going to have issues with them, definitely. And uh, Fred or Carol, are you guys seeing is is the rise of IoT in buildings changing the equation on cyber as well, good or bad? Well, I'm going to say yes. Um, going back again, I have to keep harping on the culture is um, if we, we stop and think about IT, IT is built around the CIA principle, confidentiality, integrity, availability. The IOT or OT side is flipped on its head. It's availability, integrity, and confidentiality has always been the last. Then there's the culture part of it is Let's just, I, I want this system to, I want to be able to get to this system as conveniently as possible. There's the availability. So therefore you're opening, it's just creating holes, creating holes. If you're not putting a hardened shell around it. Yes. That's my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. I would definitely agree that this, uh, the CIA is definitely flipped when you're talking about OT versus the IT. 
Um, also, when people load apps and stuff, you know, there's a thorough, you know, the guy doing the IT apps and upgrades, they do a thorough preparation. They compare it, they create a document. We don't see that in OT land. We don't see that thoroughness beforehand. And it's just accepted. Okay, go do an upgrade. Uh, if it doesn't work, try to back it out and, you know, reload the old software. That would never I, IT world. No. And, and there's one thing I would like to kind of throw in there. This is something I just read literally this morning. It's from the World Economic Forum. And it's talking about, um, in this article, what COVID-19 pandemic teaches us about cybersecurity and how to prepare for the inevitable global attack. They say the reproductive rate of COVID-19 is somewhere between two and three. I don't, uh, I don't know if that's percent of what that is, but that's the way they wrote it, without any social distancing, which means every affected person passes the virus to a couple of other people. By contrast, estimates of reproductive rate of cyber attacks is 27 and above, one of the fastest worms in history in 2003, slammer sapphire worm doubled in size and properly approximately 8.5 seconds. So we have this, this you, you have a virus in, in our world, in the cybersecurity world, is really no much different than a real virus that affects humans. The only difference is, is the speed at which it could replicate itself. Yeah, I would agree that. Kind of like measles. That's one of the worst ones we remember. Polio it had, you know, drastic uh, impact on your body. But um, I, I, the same thing. I think, I think uh, it's going to teach us all a good lesson. Um, and um, we've got to be better prepared this, and, and more um, disciplined as, as well. And one other thing, too, is I think, you know, I keep talking about culture, but a mindset. We need to shift our mindset from when I talk to people and I give them scenarios because that's what they, what I do is I, I figure out how to kill your building. So I come up with these scenarios and I get probably not from that's the, the feedback I get. We got to change that probably not to what if, because that's exactly what happened with COVID. So many people were sitting around, well, that can you just stop and think in December of last year, if you'd have told, the majority of the people in the U.S. that the, our economy was come come to a screeching halt, like it did. But most people would have said probably not. We got to change that from probably not to what if. Actually, I, I got a question for both of you. Is is if, there, if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that uh, trust is now becoming a commodity, and uh, as we as we reintroduce. Uh, the, the bubble of trust is, is, a, is sort of a, a way that we're doing it. And if we feel good and we feel that people in that area have a very low uh, infection rate, is there, any, is there any sort of replication of that in your software cybersecurity strategies that you're starting to select people into a, a bubble of trust or, or something like that? Does that make any sense? Or? That's good. It comes to mind would be certificates, right? You know, you want instead of cell side, you want to use the CO, CO authority. It prevents a man mill attack. But um, yeah, that's my only comment on that one. Well, and I always look at the human side because really, you know, it's the manufacturers are doing a lot of good. I mean, Carol and I have talked in the past. I know that Johnson is really doing a great job of trying to button down their system. So is some of the other manufacturers. The weakest link in the chain is the human, right? So in order to create that bubble of trust, there's the thing that I'm, some of you may have heard, some may not. It's called least privileges. And what that means is you get the least amount of privileges you need to do the job that you need to do. We in the culture, of in, in, uh, in building control systems is give everybody admin rights. Just let them have admin rights because Carol and them can do all that they can on their side. But if you go in and poke a hole, then you're, you're stuck with what you get. And it's, it all comes back to the human. Yeah. And the best thing you can do is point it out, but still, still you're going to rely on them to change that person's rights from admin to something else and mm -hmm. cause them to think a little bit. But. <laughs> 
Right. Sort of a general question on cyber. Um, have you guys seen a difference in cybersecurity practices in states such as California, Oregon, and a few others where back in January they passed these new cyber rules and regulations, especially for IoT devices and things like that? Yeah, I've seen a little bit. I've seen the, the specs, some specs come across my desk, uh, had conversations, um, whether or not the product meets it or not. And just, again, making sure they understood, uh, you know, yes, the product met it. And uh, if there was any question uh, how they installed it or integrating to another system, that's where the fun began. Because if you don't know what you're going to integrate and or much about the other product, it's kind of hard to answer those those uh, questions about cybersecurity. So yeah, I've seen that, and there's some uh, laws that are just about to be passed as well. Yeah. Fred, you, you agree? Like yes. Mm -hmm. I I would agree in general. Uh, I'm I'm not seeing at least on the 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 building owner side a huge rush to get everything tightened up, but. A little bit. Um, I guess for the group and maybe even people like Bill, Ben, I, I threw something out earlier this week about I'm starting to see some of the biggest cyber guys coming into the building space, like the Fortinets and Cisco's. And are you see guy, anyone seeing an uptick on that with the guys who've not been in our traditional IT space suddenly making a lot of fuss and noise? I'm, I'm seeing some uptick, the problem that, and this is, this is the concerning thing, and it doesn't matter really who I'm, I'm working for, this is Fred talking, is the thing that concerns me and has concerned me from day one is when you start coming in with IT practices and you don't take into consideration sequences of, it, of a, sequences of operation, the interdependency between devices, the levels of users that are inside the systems that are not very quick case in point. We had a customer that they, they went in and this guy got fired. They removed his user. It was a tritium system and it broke all the connections. This is their IT it was they're ripping his user out and it broke all the connections to a hundred sites. It took them, uh, I think, uh, I, Kevin Smith and I have talked because they had to get involved in it. I can't remember how many thousands of man hours to get that in. So the, the thing about it is I'm not saying I don't want them in it, but what I want them to do is to learn a little bit about the systems before they start enacting all of this stuff. So is the driver though, to your point, Anno, is the driver an opera, uh, they're, they're, going after the an opportunity because it has been well publicized that uh, there's been an uptick in cyber incidents and all that because of COVID. We all know that. And are they trying to seize the moment, take advantage of the opportunity, and then in a year and a half to two years now, presumably we get kind of a little bit further along, they're gone, which we yeah. have seen this in our industry time and time again. Yeah, that's what I was worried about when I started saw some of those articles like Fortinet and Cisco. You know, all of a sudden you you hadn't heard from them for years, and all of a sudden they're all over the place. And and to Fred's point, they they have no understanding of the domain, the interdependencies, and and how all that works. Yet, you know, I've got a couple of customers are asking me like, you know, should I, what should I do? Should I go this way, that way? You know. <clears throat> Mark, I think the, I think it might be uh, interesting to talk about what we are doing as an industry and uh, maybe uh, talk about uh, some of the new technologies that are under development uh, back that SC that was just released, but maybe uh, ask uh, Jim Butler, who's uh, chairman of the uh, our convener of the back that IT working group to tell us maybe about a little of the technology that's been put in place to address some of Fred's issues uh, in terms of uh, how can we support that change in policy and process through the technology that we're creating in a way that's uh, sensitive to the industry we're in. Yeah, it's, it's a big issue. I mean, we've 
we worked hard on back at Secure Connect to uh, provide the the channel with a means to secure the communication within building automation systems. And I think that the next step for us is to uh, help uh, the channel figure out good ways to apply this technology. Um, Fred is right to emphasize the human aspect of the problem. Many of the people in the channel are not cybersecurity experts. Um, they have uh, a superficial knowledge of uh, some aspects of cybersecurity, you know, passwords, maybe certificates. Um, but how can we, as a group, uh, provide them with uh, tools, best practices, and the like so that uh, they can apply this technology successfully. Yes, I think, you know, at Tritium, we really want to support SC eventually. And in, meanwhile, like with the latest version 4.9, it started with 4.8, but to Carol's point about um, signing any modules so that you know that it's a valid, it has a valid certificate by, um, someone with the right credentials. We started with 4.8 to say this is available and we put that security dashboard out so that you could see um, if modules were signed. But by, and 4.9, it was supposed to be mandatory that nothing will run unless it's signed. But we're rolling it out a little bit more slowly. There'll be some exceptions, but you know, with the next iteration, I'm sure it will be really hard enforcement that nothing will run unless it's um, it's got a valid uh, certificate. So it's, what we can build in, we do. Um, but then again, you're, you're still you're still still at the mercy of the operator. So let, let me pose another question. Um, down the road, whatever time frame that is, I think um, Jim Butler or, or Jim Lee was saying that the channel right now is not familiar with cybersecurity is should we have an assumption that they will never be sort of cybersecurity savvy or will they be what, what what is the right assumption to be two three years down the road in other words how foolproof do we need to make the technologies and the systems i'll i'll jump in and say um whether or not they're cybersecurity savvy, I think it's essential that if they're practitioners and they're playing in this space, they need to speak the game at some level. They need to understand it at some level. I think it's absolutely essential for any reseller in my world to be thinking cybersecurity first and then application second. I mean, the same could be said about the IT world uh, back when personal computers started showing up in, in that kind of environment and when net, they started getting connected together is there was uh, it, it had to come to the forefront. Otherwise, we'd be in a mess. So in my opinion, there has to be uh, some growth in that area for sure. Yeah, I would say it's going to be both yeah. sides. Sorry, go ahead, Carol. Well, I was just going to say, I agree. I, I think uh, in most companies, I think you are doing more training, more uh, basic networking, IT and networking training with your field technicians and engineers. And, you know, we've got to do the same or automate more things so they don't have to, you know, go out and load, uh, you know, 300 devices with certificates, you know, so, or something, you know, they got to look at all the accounts across, you know, a thousand controllers. So we got to make it easier for them or else I don't think they're going to go around and do it all. You know, the, the people that are implementing the systems that we're all familiar with, you know, there's no question everyone needs to up their game with um, security, but that's not enough. Um, one of the things we regularly do is help our partners respond to specifications and questionnaires and stuff like that. And we some see some, shall I say, inane security questionnaires that aren't helping anyone, right? Uh, they're not focused on the issues related to OT. I would say that they, some of the gaps go even beyond that, but it can't be solved just by having our side of the world know more about IT because you'll still confront 
IT departments who don't just don't understand OT and you're not going to get there that way. So this has to be solved collectively. Um, it can't be just one side. There'll never be a device that just magically is, you know, or a system. There are devices, but systems that are going to be perfect, right? So it's something, neutral. something I've said since, I don't know, I kind of started looking at cybersecurity in the built space in 2012, along with Fred. And the question I, I've always said, it's a shared responsibility between the technology providers, the manufacturers, like many of us, some of us here on the phone. It is uh, the integrator. Uh, they're part of this shared responsibility. And then so is, in this case, the building owner and the operator. So my question is, what would drop, would drop the building owner saying, you're not gonna get any work in my building or my buildings in the future unless you are taking the cybersecurity uh, seriously and you're showing me what you're going to uh, do to address cybersecurity concerns. You know, is, is that enough pressure to push more and more of the integrators into the role of taking cybersecurity uh, as part of their solutions, whatever they're delivering to the marketplace for an owner operator? So I'm not a, go ahead. I was going to say, Chad Rutch um, posed a question that's basically along their lines. Should basically should service providers, the ones that actually interface with building owners and operators, have to have a very high degree of um, uh, cybersecurity awareness? Yeah, that's another way of saying that. Sorry, Fred. Hey, no, that's fine. Um, so again, using the safety uh, culture, and I'm not a safety expert by any stroke, um, but I do know that the driving factors behind bringing that in was these people that were building buildings and that kind of thing. The people that were paying for those buildings began to say, look, you got to do so much to take, you know, to take safety and make sure that the people that are working on this job are not getting hurt or not getting killed. Otherwise, we're going to go with another contractor. It's all about motivation. And in this case, motivation of money. We are actually are working with some customers now that have in place that if their vendors are not compliant to their their processes and policies that within one to three to five years they no longer can do work for them so that is happening yeah i see that happening slowly um yeah but, uh, remember a lot of jobs are plan and spec buildings and you know the facility manager the building guy is not there yet, right? So they're, they're doing a construction and they install it. So, um, so I, think, I think if you want to help the situation, it's gotta be clearly written in specs. Um, I think we got over the complex passwords, but you know, like certificates, um, using BACnet SC over BACnet IP, things like that. I think those are the new, new items that we've got to uh, wrestle with and get them into specs as soon as we can. There is also the side of security looking at the hardware. It starts from the hardware level with secured boot with a chip on it. Then it goes to the operating system and the apps that you use. So it is almost like a fractal that we, you need to think of it. And uh, as, as Carol said, I think the, um, the tooling around it on upgrading and updating every part of the stack is the problematic part right now. There's not like a, a, every software tries to solve it in different means and the time it takes to upgrade and update is, is the deal breaker. And it does, it does take an effort and the building owners needs to understand it and they need to compensate the resellers to do the updates periodically. My two cents. And, and there's got to be some um, pain involved for people who don't upgrade their sites. There's got to be something out there to motivate them. I don't know what it is yet because uh, I see big hospitals, mm -hmm. other customers too, that are running 10 year old software, you know, 15 year old software. And that's government's job, right? Well, ransomware should help take care of that, I think, too. <laughs> 
you know, something that's kind of macro, but my son, again, a, a new engineer in a, um, a far afield, but analogous um, area of electronic medical records, um, and he developing apps, et cetera, realizing the brain drain that goes in terms of engineering to, um, to the big companies, to Google, Amazon, Microsoft. And he's like, oh, when something's wrong with Google Calendar, there's hundreds of engineers working on it immediately. Of course, Google Calendar is like perfect. And then with apps, everybody expects it to work like Google Calendar, but we can't keep enough engineers on staff. And of course, mm -hmm. here in Silicon Valley, probably the brain drain goes a little bit faster. Um, where they would rather work for these companies who are doing advertising, ad tech, you know, not electronic medical record, records or fixing buildings, but ad tech, marketing tech, Google Calendar. And I think we're, there's just too much brains on the wrong stuff. And um, I hope a reckoning comes to that. So let, uh, pivoting off that, I think it's, um, we've got what, two, three minutes left before we end. Uh, what what can we what can we all do? What can the industry do uh, moving forward as we go through COVID? Obviously, there are certain circumstances in COVID and the pandemic. What what should we do? Uh, Ken's doing, uh, you know, writing uh, writing up a lot of this in terms of where we're headed. Um, um, Fred, what what do you think we we can do that will be useful to help things along? We need to begin to, I agree with, I think it was John uh, Pitts, he said, getting IT and OT, not just uh, getting one to take over, but there has to be a blending of the two. And there has to be some, uh, I think there's also a role here that, you know, I kind of feel as I speak IT and I speak OT, there needs to be more me. You know, one of the things we've struggled with for a while in our industry is getting young, new, fresh viewpoints and people into the industry. And I've been involved with several conversations over the years about it being easier to take an IT educated college graduate and bring them into our industry these days than trying to find somebody with controls and then teach them IT. We're starting to see more and more of the younger generation as they come in have a much more IT centric background. And I, I think with time, that will just play more and more into our industry, where the mindset, the education that, that uh, workers had uh, coming into this to begin with is going to be much more security and IT centric uh, in nature. And that, that, you know, that's not an immediate solution, but that should help our industry over time. Yeah, I, the struggle I have with that, Tracy, and it's a noble thought, is that the IoT companies are sucking up all the young guys. And yeah. that's, if they want to, if the young guys want to go somewhere, that's where they're going. Well, but our industry is looking a whole lot more like an IoT industry to most people. These so days. let's automate. Let's automate. Hey, Fred, I want to say thanks for showing up, man. I one of the things I want to Thank highlight you. on your discussion, and it's what we've been talking about for six or eight weeks on this call, is it's it's not about the product, the application, the machinery. It's really the human aspect, man. We got to keep focused on that. People, labor, cybersecurity, sales models, all that stuff. It's humans. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, and it's. Um bit of an irony that uh, COVID uh, obviously affecting us people is the, the, the thing that's kind of triggering a lot of these discussions. So, uh, so we're um, at the top of the hour. So we should um, bring this to a close. Uh, I think Carol must have had uh, to go to another meeting. So thank you to Carol. Um, thanks to, to Fred. I think you've uh, livened, livened up this, uh, the conversation around the subject. Appreciate your, your perspective. Um, and um, I know that's apparently Brisbane. Well done. <laughs> All right. Well, video of this uh, will be on YouTube um, later on tonight. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week with subject TBD. We'll announce it towards the end of this week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.